Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Tonight I want to talk to you about a book that I read about a year ago. It's called Convergence, Artificial Intelligence and Quantum Computing, Social, Economic and Policy Impacts. It's right over here to the left. And I think it gives a very fascinating glimpse to a future that is perhaps not as distant as some of us may think. Now, while AI has stolen most of the spotlight, I do think that quantum computing is a sneaky technology that some of us should pay more attention to, even though it doesn't get quite the publicity. But before we talk about the book, I think it's important that we make sure we have all of our definitions straight. So first off, let's talk about what AI is, and then we'll talk about what quantum computing is. Now, the diagram that you're looking at on the right is this diagram that shows AI is the big overarching term. And this is a quote that I like about it. And uh, it says that AI encompasses both real and fictional efforts to imitate human and animal intelligence and creativity with machines and code. And from the AI, a modern approach textbook, which I own, which is actually over here, this one <laughs> right here, uh, it says the field is concerned with not just understanding, but also building intelligent entities, machines that can compute how to act effectively and safely in a wide variety of novel situations. So we might be familiar with ChatGPT or Claude or Grok2, which are all examples of deep learning models, but we also may have Roombas or we might have Siri or Alexa, which are also applications of artificial intelligence. Now let's talk about quantum computing. Now, quantum computing leverages the properties of subatomic particles to perform calculations that are just exponentially faster than any classical computer. IBM is probably the leader in this technology, though Google, I believe, is also developing their own quantum computer. So this is the Heron, which holds 156 qubits that has to be kept at extremely low temperatures, close to absolute zero. So it's encased in that tower that you see on the right here. And they can operate in an extremely large number of states simultaneously, whereas a classical computer can only operate in one state at any given moment because classical computers use classical bits that can only be zero or one. But quantum computers use quantum bits or qubits. And because quantum systems can be in states of superposition, meaning they can simultaneously be in states like zero and one in the case of a qubit, they just have exponentially more computing power. To give you an idea of what large number of states means, if you had 300 qubits, then two raised to the 300 is a number that is bigger than the amount of particles there are in the known universe. So that is just an example of how exponential growth works, just in the sense that if you had on the order of 100 qubits, you can already do so many different types of calculations. But because they are so sensitive to the outside world and we have to keep them encased at very low temperatures, there are some difficult engineering challenges to making them more scalable and usable in everyday life. Now, I'll admit, quantum computing and artificial intelligence can be intimidating topics to the newcomer, but they don't have to be, especially if you learn from today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data analysis, programming, science, and yes, artificial intelligence. Brilliant uses a first principles approach that helps you build understanding from the ground up. Each and every single lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Instead of making you memorize, Brilliant helps you build your critical thinking skills through problem solving. Even if you only have a few minutes each day, using that time to learn is one of the most important things you can do, both for your personal and professional growth. It's the complete opposite of mindless scrolling. I've been using Brilliant myself on my phone to replace social media time. It's been a great asset for me to reinforce ideas in artificial intelligence, especially how large language models like ChatGPT work. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash Kyle or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now let's get back to our discussion. 
Okay, so now that we've talked about what artificial intelligence and what quantum computers are, I'm just going to talk about the three chapters in this book that I will share with you uh, that cover social impact, economic impact, and policy impact. Each of these impacts have multiple essays. Essentially, each chapter is its own essay with a different author, like you see here. So I'm just going to give you one from each of the different sections that I thought were very interesting. For quantum delegation, I generated this pretty cute image of a quantum artificial intelligence system with the DAL E image generator from OpenAI. And the idea of quantum delegation is that organizations, even today, are starting to trust automation and algorithms to handle the decision making processes that used to be just human made, right? And I think a great example of this I experienced today when I went to McDonald's, when I ordered my food, I went to a panel and I just clicked the buttons to order the food that I wanted. And then the order was sent to the workers in the, you know, the back and they made the food and they brought it out to me. There was also a time when I was in grad school and I went to the sushi restaurant where this robot delivered my drinks to me in the sushi restaurant. It just sort of rolled up on wheels and just handed me, not handed me, but it just had the drinks just on a tray and I just picked it up right from the tray. And this is a very small example, but you can imagine a future perhaps where it's going to be robots or agentic like humanoids that are going to be making the food and bringing the food out to us and that might just do away with the need for for human cooks right and I, I don't know how that's going to how that's going to work in practice but I don't think it's hard to imagine considering what we're experiencing on the day-to-day -day basis another point that this chapter makes is that humans are not very good at non-linear data processing and one example that it cites is in human relationships now, there is this idea in sociology, I believe, called Dunbar's number. And now Dunbar's number is about to be like 150 or so. And it's sort of this hypothetical upper limit as to how many meaningful relationships a human can effectively keep track of. Now, I don't know about you, but I have more than 150 you know, people on Facebook or on Instagram or on YouTube. And it already feels like just impossible to keep track of everyone because it really kind of is for our human brains because in terms of people who know you really well and can get to know you and what drives you and you also knowing stuff about them and their family and their interests, that takes time and effort. And we unfortunately don't have infinite amounts of time or energy to spend as humans. And so we Unfortunately, we'll just have to limit ourselves in terms of our uh, scope of friends and connections we can possibly make in our lifetimes just because we don't have the capacity to hold all that information and all those people's names and their siblings' names and their parents' names and all those kinds of uh, pieces of information. But to a quantum artificial intelligence system, that's no problem whatsoever. And I think for humans, right, we're so used to sort of the Newtonian way of thinking, you know, if we have this situation, we have some sort of de deterministic, uh, you know, algorithm or equation, we'll just follow it, you know, step by step in a very linear process. But we're living in such a interconnected global world today that it's so hard to sort of understand how one thing can affect the other. These systems are not necessarily independent of each other. And I don't think we are, even you know, with all of our training and our math and our models, we're not really great at thinking beyond a sort of linear fashion. But a quantum AI system will be. Does that mean we should give it all of our responsibilities? That's a question for another time. And as I mentioned before, it increases our interconnectedness, but we have the threat of losing human centralized decision making. Like for example, in the small microcosm of like the McDonald's or the sushi restaurant I was at, right? This gets into a can of worms in terms of jobs and how do we replace those jobs? What do those humans whose jobs were automated do now? And all are valid concerns that I think we might be seeing the response to in the not so distant future. And by not so distant future, I would say before 2026, which who knows, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what it feels like the way that things are going right now. So next slide. This one is about economic impact. And this is one of my favorite chapters in the whole book. It's called How the US Economy Will Fail. 
and how to stop it. And so again, I generated this graphic from Dall E. And what this chapter is, or at least what it starts with, is a fictional story that describes this worst case scenario. It's where Wall Street becomes heavily reliant on quantum computing algorithms that they really don't understand, very much like how the 2008 financial crisis occurred. And in this fictional scenario, a foreign adversary, I won't mention who, but you can imagine who, uses quantum code breaking techniques as well as quantum hacking to break RSA secure algorithms to force Wall Street computers to make these really, really bad trades that effect effectively will crash the value of the US dollar. Now, obviously that story is fictional, but I do think it emphasizes a scary reality with what quantum computers, especially when paired with artificial intelligence, can do. I just watched this really awesome documentary by Bloomberg, which was on quantum computing. It featured Professor Hannah Fry, who is one of my favorite STEM communicators out there. And I'll, I'll put a link to it in the description, as well as I'll put some thumbnail here so you guys can know what it's about. But in that documentary, they talked about how breaking encryption, modern day encryption methods, will be one of the first use cases if a quantum computer is successfully created that can you know maintain a strong coherence among the different quantum states for a large number of qubits, uh, more than they can currently hold. And so I think this chapter really spoke to me because it made me think a lot about the 2008 financial crisis and all the books and the and movies I've watched about that and how we become so reliant on these technologies that we we don't really think about what the implications of them are and how vulnerable we could be to misunderstanding them or if someone wanted to take advantage of our ignorance uh, we would be completely unaware and unprepared for it so I really do like this chapter and I really do like this graphic I made because I think it kind of captured the essence of what this chapter was was talking about. Lastly, we'll talk about policy impact. And this chapter is called, Should We Let the Machine Decide What is Meaningful? Now, the authors, I believe graduate student said this quote, uh, Shangji Guo said, Quote, when a human is unable to process the data or the statistics or even structure of the data, should we let the machine decide what is meaningful? And I really love this question because we are already seeing the consequences of deep learning models that have just inscrutable information that we can't really fully understand, right? Like if we think about like a large language model, for example, and how words are converted to numerical vectors in some high dimensional vector space and are represented by some sort of embedding vector. And then there's this weird connection between embedding vectors and, and the, the words and how does it, how do we define sort of direction and semantics in this large dimensional, you know, vector space. I think when you, when you already start talking about it like that, it, it already just feels like a bunch of mumbo jumbo, I think. Even to people who have the technical training to understand the math, I think it's it's still I think it's just hard for us as humans who are limited by our three dimensional world to get a good intuitive sense of how these machines are doing what they're doing in these high dimensional spaces, and at the point where we can no longer really understand what's going on underneath the hood, do we take it as truth? And what does truth even mean in that scenario? I mean, if we can't verify what the machine is doing, if we're just going to have to accept what the machine tells us, is that truth, really? And this kind of gets me thinking about things like Gödel's theorem, which I don't fully grasp yet. But um, if any people who are trained in pure mathematics or mathematics in general can explain Gödel's theorem better than I can, I'm all ears, please leave a comment below. But it kind of gets me thinking about Gödel's theorem, how there are some statements that we can see to be self, sort of self-evident that are true, but we can never actually prove are true. And I'm wondering how that connects with this in the sense if we had some quantum computing AI system that makes decisions and, and, and comes up with solutions that we can't even begin to comprehend, but they work. Do we accept it as true? And how do we... How do we even 
make sure we're we're on the right path. And that's where the hardware and software sandboxing comes in, where the author talks a little bit about human intervention, the sense that we have to provide it some human feedback and watch the system develop over time to have them, quote, prove to us that they are aligned with our goals. I sometimes wonder, though, if this would be a great example of how AIs could potentially deceive us in the sense that perhaps they go along with our intuition or they produce things that match our intuition up to a point and lull us into a false sense of security before ultimately betraying us in some some uh, meaningful way. I'm not so sure, but I think that's still something to, to consider. And with that, I think I have been just rambling uh, long enough for this video. It's quite late. It's like one in the morning, but I always think that thoughts after midnight are some of the most interesting thoughts a human can have. So I don't know. That's what I think. Leave a comment below if you think that's true. And thank you if you've watched all the way to the end. I know it's been a while since I've made a video like this. I've been a little bit sick for over the past couple of weeks, but um, I really did enjoy making this video. I'm so happy I finally got to talk about Convergence because it is one of the books of the year for me uh, in 2023 because I thought it really opened my mind to this really exciting but also potentially scary future where these technologies can come in and especially now that we're in this ai wave i definitely think it's possible that we can reach ai and quantum computing systems more quickly because if you imagine we somehow get agi whatever that means it could iterate uh, on current engineering capabilities of quantum computers and just push us f further along in the development of this technology so again Thanks for watching. Please consider liking the video and subscribing if you uh, liked it. And let me know if you like this kind of format. I really do like using Keynote to make presentations. And so I would be more than happy to make more presentations like this moving forward to share my thoughts. So thank you again, and I hope you have a great evening.